Count Basie dies, goes to heaven. St. Peter meets him at the gates and says, good to see you. Listen, I got some good news and some bad news. Which one do you want first? Count Basie says, eh, give me the good news. So St. Peter says, listen, all the musicians up here, every single one of them have been waiting for you to die because they say you're the guy to lead heaven's orchestra. And Count Basie says, really? And St. Peter says, oh yeah. And I mean everybody from like Miles Davis all the way to Mozart and Beethoven to Prince to Tom Petty. They say you're the guy who can lead all these diverse styles and make it work. You're their leader. And Count Basie says, wow, I really am in heaven. What an honor. What could possibly be the bad news? St. Peter leans in and he says, Jesus has this chick singer. Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. And that was a classic joke told by a classic joke teller, Jeff Cesario. As a reminder, in these trying times, I'm starting every episode with a joke, and I'm inviting listeners to submit their own jokes if they're so inclined. Third-story.com is the place to go to do that and much more. Today, I want to tell you a story. When I was a little kid, my dad was on the road more than he was home. As you may know, he's a jazz musician. And when he would come home, he'd be on the phone setting up the next tour, the next project. So the house was alive with characters calling in and passing through. I remember picking up the phone and it would be Moe's looking for my dad. Or some Italian promoter. Or Richie Cole. Richie and Ben, that's what I call my dad, did all sorts of projects together when I was a boy. Records, tours, TV shows even. Richie Cole passed away on May 2nd of this year. He was 72 years old. And despite a series of physical ailments, years of hard living in the jazz life, and the fact that he lived his final years in the kind of facility that COVID-19 tends to sweep through these days, he apparently died of what his daughter, Alto Annie Cole, described as natural causes. See, everything with Richie was alto this and alto that. He played the alto saxophone. When he lived in Northern California, he called his home Alto Acres. The van that he drove back and forth across the country from gig to gig in the 1970s and 80s, that was the alto van. And he referred to his style of playing as alto madness. He was a character. Richie was full of energy and life, and he was a ferocious musician. Here's a taste of his playing on Freddie Hubbard's Back to Birdland album recorded in 1982. Richie began to play alto saxophone when he was 10 years old. He was encouraged by his father, who owned a jazz club in New Jersey, and he showed talent and promise very early. Phil Woods was an early mentor to Richie. In 1969, at the age of 21, he joined drummer Buddy Rich's big band. After that, he worked with Lionel Hampton and Doc Severinsen, and then he formed his own quintet. He performed and recorded with Nancy Wilson, Tom Waits, the Manhattan Transfer, Hank Crawford, Freddie Hubbard, Phil Woods, Sonny Stitt, Art Pepper, and he recorded over 50 albums as a leader. He spent much of his life on the road. I couldn't begin to guess how many gigs Richie Cole played and how many rhythm sections, student bands, and pickup ensembles he worked with. But it was Richie's relationship with singer and lyricist Eddie Jefferson that was maybe the most fundamental and impactful for him. Eddie Jefferson is considered to be the inventor of the vocalese technique of writing lyrics to instrumental jazz solos. His most famous lyric is probably Moody's Mood for Love, which was made famous later by King Pleasure. You know the one. There I go, there I go, there I go. Richie and Eddie were from different generations, different racial backgrounds, but they were clearly brothers. They were on tour in the Midwest in the spring of 1979. In fact, it was right about now, early May. When late at night after a gig in Detroit, Eddie was shot and killed outside of Baker's Keyboard Lounge, apparently by a disgruntled former dancer who he had worked with and fired some time before. 
and Richie was there. He witnessed it. Some say he never fully recovered from that event. Incredibly, there is concert footage of Richie and Eddie performing in Chicago on that same tour just days before he was killed. The band features bassist Kelly Sill and drummer Joel Spencer. It's a classic Chicago rhythm section if ever there was one. Check out Eddie singing his famous lyric. It's almost certainly the last document of him singing it. There I go, there I go, there I go, there I go. Pretty baby, you are the soul that snaps my control. Such a funny thing, but every time you near me, I never can behave. You give me a smile and then I'm wrapped up in your magic. There's music all around me, crazy music, music that keeps calling me so very close to you. Turns me your slave. Come and do with me any little thing you want to. Anything, baby, just let me get next to you. Am I insane or do I really see heaven in your eyes? Bright as stars that shine up above there in the clear blue sky. How I worry about you, just can't live my life without you, baby. Come here, don't have no fear. Oh, is there wonder why? I'm really feeling in the mood for love And tell me why I stop to think About this weather, my dear This little dream might fade away There I go a-talking out of my head again Oh baby, won't you come and put our two hearts together That would make me strong and brave Oh, when we are one I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid If there's a cloud up above us Go on and let it rain I'm sure our love together can turn where we came oh, My baby, won't you please let me love you Get a relief from this awful misery Then the girl said, that is all this time My memories of Richie are a patchwork of music and mayhem. He was always encouraging me to sit in with the band, long before I was in any way ready, like at the age of four when he taught me how to coax one note out of a clarinet, apparently it was an A, and then told me to walk out on stage to play my note. So that was probably my first jam session, playing that one ridiculous note that Richie showed me. Later on, when I was maybe 10, he encouraged me to get up and sing a blues with the band, and I remember sitting in at Fat Tuesdays in New York. There was just one catch. I had to come up on stage wearing a Richie Cole mask. He traveled with his own stash of them. As a teenager in the early 90s, I started to play gigs on drums at little joints in Madison where I grew up, like Mr. P's Place. Some of my first gigs were in an organ trio with my dad on organ and Richie Cole on saxophone. Richie at that time had sort of landed in Rockford, Illinois, and he would come up to Madison to play with us. He always had some shtick. One time he showed up with a full-sized cardboard cutout of Bill Clinton holding a saxophone, and he insisted on trading fours back and forth with the thing. Another time for a holiday show, he arrived in a Santa suit with the beard and everything. And then there was the time when he drove up to Madison with a trumpet player friend who he maintained had also been the model on the packaging for Mr. Clean and asked us to help him record a demo of the song Midnight at the Starlight Haunted Ballroom. We obliged, of course. By the time I met him, Everywhere Richie played, no matter what the band was, he always introduced them as the Alto Madness Orchestra. Sometime in the early 2000s, Richie called me and asked me if I could put together a rhythm section for a gig with him just outside of Rockford, which is about 90 minutes from Madison, where I was still living. I don't think he was living in Rockford anymore, but he had his contacts there. Anyway, I called my pals Tim Whalen on piano and John Mezzaloris on bass, and I played drums. This was before GPS. I remember we were driving and driving, first on a four-lane highway, then a two-lane road, then it was an unlit country road in the middle of nowhere. Nothing but farmland and woods around us. And I was thinking, this cannot possibly be the right place. All of a sudden, we came to an intersection with what looked like a, an old gas station on the corner that had been converted into a roadhouse. And in the window was a poster. One night only, Richie Cole and the Alto Madness Orchestra. 
When we walked through the door, it was like the needle came off the record, and the whole band just turned and looked at us, three kids carrying our instruments. And then they looked away again. The bartender, without lifting his head, pointed to a room in the back, a carpeted dining room with a drop, fireproof ceiling and that harsh, fluorescent lighting. We set up in a corner and waited. The gig was supposed to start at like 8. At 7.59, Richie walks through the door, big hug, big energy, handed out the books. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Alto Madness Orchestra. We did two tunes with him, something up-tempo, I think probably Cherokee, followed by a ballad. Then he turned to us and said, Okay, boys, trio time. And he retreated to the bar for the rest of the set. The last time I saw Richie was in Cleveland in 2017. He was living in Pittsburgh, and he came in to play with us at the club Nighttown with me and my dad, Billy Peterson on bass, and Bob Rockwell on saxophone. Ladies and gentlemen, Richie Cole. There was something bittersweet and slightly tragic about the experience. Oh my goodness. I didn't know he was here. He was physically very fragile. His playing was somewhat strained, but the ideas were alive in their way. And as always, they contained the history that he carried within him, that he embodied, that he represented. I covered that gig and that experience in episode 80 of this podcast as part of the Mob Town Tour series. We were lucky to know you, Richie. We were lucky to be in your orchestra. I guess now it really is trio time. Third-story.com is the place to go to visit the archive. While you're there, you know this. You know this. You can get connected to the Patreon page, all my socials, subscribe, all the good stuff. To start today, I want to share that short conversation I had in 2017 with Richie at Nighttown in Cleveland. Richie Cole, Ben Sidron, yes, me, you, Kid Leo, Kid Night Leo. Town, Night Town, Cleveland. Cleveland, yep, Cleveland, long, long time coming, long time gone, yep. So Richie, we've been talking out here about being on the road, how that used to be the thing, how you, I know it was so important to you when you were coming up, being on that bus, being on Buddy's bus, man, that being a way of life, and then you were on the road in the van with Eddie, that the road was was everything, man. Yep, it was. So looking back, man, now the world is so totally different. Uh, can you frame your career based on the fact that the road is not there the way it used to be? How has that affected you? What does well, that do? you know, it, it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that I'm, I'm almost 70 years old now, and I, I broke my leg a couple years ago, so my, I can't. I can't move like I used to. Plus, the traveling these days, it, it used to be fun to be on an airplane and go. It was fascinating. It was like, oh, my God, bro, oh, my God, L.A., man. And I was like, oh, God, I got to go back to Rome again. Shit. You know? If you go through the, all the security and everything, it's just a pain in the ass to travel these days. It used to be fun. Plus, you know, I've seen as much as I want to see of the world. You know, I've been there. I'd like to go back again, maybe, but it just, it just hurts too much these days. You know, I'm living in Pittsburgh now. I got a lot of good things happening. Got my recording company. I got a lot of little local gigs. I still travel. I might be going, might be going to Italy after the first of the year, and uh, and um, you know I got, I got my 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 daughter and grandkids out in out in New Jersey, so I go back there and do a few things uh, in New York. They live up in Roselle Park, North Jersey. But uh, I'm perfectly happy li li living my life living my life right now as it is. You know. And thank you, thank God I met you, Ben Sidron. You know, I have I have several people in my life that were very, very important. Buddy Rich in the beginning, 1969, was a Buddy Rich band, two and a half years. Then Eddie Jefferson, very, very important. Meeting the Manhattan Transfer, meeting you, Ben Sidron, and Kid Leo when you were three years old, playing that one note on the clarinet, which I'll never forget. A. It was an A. a. It was an A. It was Squeak. An a. It was perfect. It's it like. He knew one note. Squeak. Perfect. You perfect. Know? Unfortunately, the song was in B-flat, but that's all It right. doesn't matter. It's it doesn't like matter. a tone. He was ahead of his time, even at three years old. You know, you know dig? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, one of the thrills of my life was uh, 
working and recording with Sonny Stitt, and that was, you know, he was always been my hero since I was a kid. So there's several people important, like I say, you're one of them, and uh, a lot of other people in between, but several, like, milestone people. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been very, very lucky in my career. I can't complain. And I'm doing fine now. I, I have no women in my life. I'm like Martin Luther King. Thank God Almighty. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm living in a one-room apartment a, with two TVs and a piano in a retirement home, and I love it in Pittsburgh. So that, that's my story, guys. I'm the luckiest guy I know. That's, I, that's pretty much it, man. Boom. I mean, that, I don't think you can go very many places after that. No, that's Boom. it, man. The luckiest guy in the world, man. I'm the luckiest guy I know. <laughs> Not that I've been always been that lucky. You know my story. Yeah, yeah. I've, no, I've been up I mean, and down but, but forever. To come, to, to, to come through the trials and tribulations <laughs> that you've been through, and to be here positive in the end. With an attitude, good attitude. A, a you know? good attitude, yeah. but I guess it's a cliche to say it, but, you know, the music got you through it, right? It did. Yeah, but only because music. of music. Without the music, who, who knows where I'd be? I don't, I don't know. Music got me through it, you know? i just been... Uh, a lot of things fell into place for me. Like I say, I've been very fortunate to meet a lot of great people who helped me out, and I learned from. And now I'm trying to pass it on to other people yeah. uh, to help them out, you know? Well, and the, the fact that you got involved in, in writing, doing arrangements and doing charts, man, that's sort of like when, when the situation was really rough and you had physical problems and all this stuff, you immediately turned to things you could do by yourself without traveling, man, which was very interesting, man. Remember that, that record we did, the uh, uh, Max, 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 the violins <laughs> section? You had eight guys named Max, Weinberg, Goldberg, uh, Disberg. Boom. We did a violin, band, man. Remember that on the liner notes, I said, I, I wrote this, I wrote this music in every, every bar from Sydney to Singapore to Hong Kong, every airport bar. Yep. <laughs> I think you uh, you write those notes. Yeah, I, think. I probably wrote that. It notes. was fantastic, you know. No. Well, here we, see, this is me and Richie. We've been on the road together, not always in the same place, not simultaneously. Not simultaneously, but we're out on the road now. This has been since 1978, yeah. so that would be coming up on 40 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see you down the road. And here we are. Still hanging in there, Alto Madness. Alto Madness. Richie Cole, <laughs> the luckiest guy I know. In the 1980s, my dad had an interview program on NPR called Sidron on Record, not unlike this one, in which he conducted long-form conversations with jazz musicians. He talked to Richie Cole for the program in 1985. And viewed through the lens of history, that interview illuminates just what Richie's life was like at the time, his itinerary, his mentality, his hilarity what he cared about, and how he lived. Here's an excerpt of that conversation. I have here in front of me, Richie, a document, the authentic document that I think jazz fans around the world would like to get their hands on, and barring that, would like to know a little bit about. This is the Richie Cole tour calendar. Anybody who knows anything about your history knows that you have been on the road for... How many years have you been traveling now? Um, I lost track. Many years, Ben. Many years, many years. okay. Started out at one point in your van, right? The Alto van? That's right. I started out at one point in my Volkswagen bus. Uh -huh. And then I went to the Alto van, and I still have the Alto van. Literally, all your stuff, all the good things in the van, mm -hmm. driving from gig to gig. Yeah, I have a garage for it now, though. It's uh, the only difference. Prosperity has come to <laughs> Alto Acres. But that van carried you and uh, vocalist Eddie Jefferson across the United States. That's right. Several times across the country, all up and down the West Coast and the East Coast. If, if it can only talk... Or sing, even. Right. <laughs> this tour calendar for this year, a little bit of, of background here. I mean, uh, for this month, let's see where we are this month. After you leave me, you're on your way to Chicago. Then Trenton, your hometown. Mm -hmm. After Trenton, nice routing here, Tacoma, Washington. Then Scottsdale, Arizona. Scottsdale, Arizona to Havana, Cuba. Right, Havana. Nice, nice routing. Nice Good routing. routing. Your manager's on it. After uh, Cuba is back from Cuba, and then uh, Arcadia, California, I guess. Then nice routing. No, then a quick jump over to Bismarck, North Dakota. <laughs> right. Quick two weeks in Montana, I noticed, mm -hmm. after Montana. A little jump over to the Houston College, I guess, then up to Cleveland, over to Buffalo. One-nighters here. One-nighter in Detroit. Two nights in Detroit. Up. Then a week of cruise, L.A. to Mexico. Nice routing. Nice routing. The uh, routing is really, uh, it's really important. looking good. After the cruise, to Minneapolis spending a week compressed into 
two nights at Gabriel's. <laughs> right. And then uh, University of Minnesota. Then back to Denver. We're three months down the line. I should be specific. A quick, here. A quick shot on a Sunday to Austin, Texas. Right. Uh, back to Denver. Back to Denver. Quick Sunday shot to Austin. Another month goes by. Turn the page. Here we are. Purdue, Indiana. Telluride. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Hobbs, New Mexico. So you got three days off here. Something went wrong, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then the next oh, week, Hungary. Hungary, yes. Then uh, Finland. And this rounding out this month uh, in Russia. Mm -hmm. Turning the page, if I may. Well, Europe goes on. This is kind of is this normal? It's normal. It's out out to amend this uh, tour plan. Yes, it's pretty. It's pretty normal. This is planned out carefully. <laughs> yeah, you know, scientifically designed. Havana to Bismarck. It's very <laughs> <laughs> scientifically designed. You seem to have maintained your humor very well in light of the massive traveling that you do. Is traveling something that keeps you happy, or oh, you I stay enjoy happy it. in spite of it? No, I, I enjoy traveling. I enjoy traveling, and then when I get home. I enjoy being home because when I'm home, I don't. I just sit and uh, just really vegetate, put my satellite dish on, watch a little TV, and uh, mm -hmm. then after a few days of that, I start getting inspired and start getting back into the music again. But after a few days of that, I'm ready to hit the road again. Mm -hmm. So I, I enjoy traveling. It gives me a lot of inspiration, a lot of a lot of ideas, and I meet I meet a lot of interesting people along the way. How's traveling changed for you today versus ten, fifteen years ago? Well. I'm traveling in um, larger jumps, as you can see, Havana to Arcata, and um, doing more flying and le less driving, actually, which I'm glad of because I'm 37 now, and I, I do feel the difference. It's not as easy as it used to be to get in the van after the gig and drive 400 miles. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. Last few years, I've noticed that, especially like when I work in New York and back and forth to Trenton every night after the gig. It's it's hard now, you know. It's difficult. It's it used to be uh, nothing, but but now I, I I do notice something. Or or from Alto Acres to San Francisco, you know, two hours back and two hours forth, and uh, it's not as easy as it used to be. So I I'm enjoying flying more now. And uh, other than that, you know, the gigs a little better, and uh, I'm having more fun as the years go on. I enjoy music more and more. I get more inspired. Talk about the days in the van with uh, Eddie Jefferson. Oh, is, is there a moment that stands out when you think all those miles you drove? Was there one moment that you remember as being the <laughs> yeah, typical it's the, moment? it's the moment. The one time I let Eddie drive the van and we almost <laughs> plowed into a bridge, uh -huh. that moment. And saved only by Duke. Duke Jordan saved us. I came from Trenton, picked Eddie up in New York at the Port Authority. And we're on our way. We actually, we're on our way to, um, actually, we were on our way to Madison, Wisconsin, to the Blue Frog here in Madison many years ago. And uh, we picked up Duke uh, Jordan. I keep wanting to say Duke Pierce, Duke Jordan, and uh, I got as far as uh, Central Ohio, and I just I just said, Eddie, I'm, I'm I can't drive anymore. I'm tired. So Eddie wasn't familiar with uh, the gear shifts. He always had a, a automatic Cadillac, you know. Mm -hmm. So what what we did, we <laughs> cruised into the parking lot of the rest stop, and we like cruised at a slow speed, and I put him behind the wheel as we were moving. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got from behind Eddie sat down and then, then uh, you know I got it back into high gear back on the highway went to the back of the van to take a few quick um, Z's you know and all of a sudden the van starts rocking and shaking I hear screaming and yelling in the front Eddie fell asleep at the wheel because uh, you know he, he was uh, you know a little on his years too he, 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 he was up with me all night too and so then he fell asleep and at the last minute Duke Jordan Scream, no, no, to the right, turn right, turn right, turn right. And I, oh, I, I, I jumped up in the back, and I saw this embankment in my face. And then I said, well, Eddie, I guess, Eddie, I had enough sleep. I think I'll take over from now. So that would be the one moment. Other than that, it was just many, many moments and hours of Eddie telling me stories. I wish I had a tape recorder on then. He told me all about, you know, all about show business and when he was a hoofer and all about the all the guys in, in the music business. He knew them all. Mm -hmm. So it was some... Uh, it was real history going down, and I wish it was a way to preserve it. I wish I could remember it. I wish I could remember those things. I'm sure they're in my head somewhere, but it's so clogged up with other things that it, it won't come out right. I've always suspected that one of the reasons you got on the road that way was to participate in history, to be a part of it, to intentionally go out there and be a part of history. That's, that's true, because that's the way it was traditionally done. Being out on the road, you know, you and the road, and if the tire blows, you got to deal with it, you know. And, uh, and I, I enjoyed that because I always had to sense of adventure mm -hmm. and uh, I like I like to surround myself with with the real thing so I, I got a taste of the real thing and I'm, I'm still tasting it 
Here yeah. I am now, right? Yeah. Uh, you picked me up, what, uh, 7 o'clock this morning? 7 o'clock this morning, picked you up off a flight. You got on that flight at 6.45 yeah. in the morning, yeah. talking about the night before. Gave you, <laughs> gave you the name of a piano player to check out at a club tomorrow night in right. another city. Right, right. Talk a little bit about the development of the Alto Madness persona. How did that come about? Where did it start? And talk a little bit about how it developed. Well... It just it kind of developed on its own. It, it was the, the the only plan I had was to was to keep working on my music and play the saxophone and play music as well as I could do it. And but what's this madness thing? Where did, did you say this is alto madness, or did somebody say you know this guy is alto madness? How did that come about? You know I really don't know. It just it just came about. Uh, I've been using alto madness for years, and of course I tell everybody this. I I can't take credit for it because. Jackie McLean had an album out called Alto Madness, and when I saw it, I kind of, I liked the way that set, you know, Alto Madness, I liked that, you know, and I kind of adopted it as my own, and a few years ago, I had an opportunity to thank Jackie McLean for allowing me to get so much mileage out of uh, Title. His, his Alto Madness, which he, of course, got from Tenor Madness, and at the time, you know, that, that was when everybody, uh, all the groups had titles, Chicago, yes. Manhattan Transit Authority. Uh -huh. You know, and, and different different groups like that. So it was just uh, part of the times, too. And the Alto Manus has stuck, and the title has stuck, but the music has been, been changing all these years, and it's, it's still changing, and it's getting ready to change drastically at this very moment. As we speak. As we speak. Well, in the past, Alto Madness has been built on bebop, pure, straight-ahead, right. standard uh, confirmation, jazz, Cherokee, and half-step, flat-out bebop playing, but with a little additional spin on it. For that's, example, that's the madness. The madness part. The Naugahyde reality, for example. Right. The poetry readings and people who haven't seen you cannot grasp from your albums or from this conversation. We're having exactly what the Naugahyde reality. Can you give us just a, a minute of the Naugahyde reality? This would be in conjunction with uh, great alto uh, bebop playing. Right, well, something like uh, you know, the Naugahyde reality spoke to me in conjunction with the... Uh, abstract truth of the destitutional force. Okay, that's you know, a synopsis. Something like that. Capsule. The Naugahyde reality is a verbalization, almost a characterization. Reminds me a little bit of uh, the character Tim Hauser of the Manhattan Transfer plays uh, El Dorado Caddy. Oh, yeah. That's different, but it's a characterization that people hang on to. And that showbiz part of what you did became part of your image, part of your success, and part of the reasons critics started flailing at you, right? Either, either liking it or hating it. And uh, you, you pointed out to me, and it's very true, that I'm, I'm torn, I'm a man torn between getting more and more serious and going more and more into show business. And I, I love both. I mean, I, I, I love the, the show business aspect, which I think had a lot to do with the influence of Eddie Jefferson. Not, not to mention uh, Lionel Hampton and Buddy Rich, but Eddie Jefferson, I mean, he, he, he showed me that that's what, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you keep, keep the music in the right perspective and, and you, it doesn't interfere with the music. And I've gone through phases when it has interfered with the music, but at least I saw it mm -hmm. and, and caught it in time. But I'm, I'm constantly experimenting with, with my music and my life. And when you experiment, you're, you're bound to, do, to step over the, over the limits now mm -hmm. and then. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you mentioned both uh, Lionel Hampton and Buddy Rich, uh, band leaders with whom you've worked and traveled. Right. And Eddie Jefferson, these are all people who were very much involved in the theatricality of this music, a presentation, not just going up there and blowing and walking That's right. off. And out of that came your persona. But now you say it's changing. Why is this? Well, I'm developing my, my, own, my own style of popular music. Nouveau Madness. Nouveau Madness. Yes. I'm, uh, my, my concern for, for, for people and people relating to my music is, is very prevalent. I, I enjoy people understanding and appreciating what I do. And I want to reach a larger audience. And I'm, I'm developing my own form my own sound in the popular music idiom in the past one of the wonderful players that you shared the stage with and part of his life with was alto player Sonny Stitt if I'm not mistaken you recorded with him uh, the, his last performance well uh, in fact it was for a national public radio at the uh, Carnegie Hall tribute to Art Pepper that's right and Sonny and I played and it's the first and last time Sonny and I played tenors together uh -huh. I played my tenor with him and we toured Australia Together, uh, Jack Wilson and, and Sonny and I went down and played with uh, some local guys from Australia. And Sonny Stitt was, has always been one of my heroes, one of my absolute favorites. And to, to actually find myself on the bandstand playing with him and, and knowing him as a man was, was quite a thrill for me. 
you can get strength from that, can't you? That you can carry on with oh, you. Oh, a lot of strength and a lot of inspiration. And uh, he was such a such a nice person, and it's great loss not having him around. But he can he contributed so much for the time that he was around that uh, there's a, there's a lot of recorded music. Classic bebop, pretty, Abs absolutely, Got pretty. Some, you're pretty, happy, happy, humorous, swinging, swinging. <laughs> All those things that we can't live without. That's right. And those are characteristics that you personally have tried to put into your performances, the happiness. Well, that, that's, what I, that's what I hear. That, that's the kind of music I hear. And even like we were talking about the, my new uh, Nouveau Madness, yes. it's still the same, same sound, just in a, in a different, different context, different format. Because that, that's the kind of music I, 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 I hear and I like to play. I like to play optimistic, happy music, music that people, people come away feeling good about. Talk a little bit about Sonny Stitt and the little brief time you spent with him. Every moment of being on the stage playing with, with Sonny was, was an absolute thrill for me. And uh, Nothing about the way he tied his shoes or buttoned his shirts or anything? We keep hoping that there'll be these great moments yeah, of, right. of insight that will illuminate the music, but there aren't, are there? It's just the ongoingness of it all. It's just, yeah, it's just the, the total experience. Maybe that's a point that would be valuable to point out to listeners, and that is jazz does not happen in great flashes of inspiration, but happens a little bit every single day. It does, and, and Sonny Stitt was just a person like you and I and, and everyone else out there. We're just people. It's, there's, it's nothing, it's nothing uh, magical or holy about it. We're just people, and uh, th 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 that's a point that uh, sometimes people don't really understand. That we're just people. We feel things. We feel good. We feel bad. We get hurt. We, uh, we feel everything that, that everyone else out there feels, and it, it's, you know, it's as simple as that. And also, we're, we're fortunate in that we were given a certain talent, and also that we had uh, enough insight, or maybe it wasn't even an intentional thing, that we just kind of followed a path that all of a sudden we found ourselves in the middle of a situation where we're playing music, and one thing leads to another, you play with someone else, and you get to a different point in music, all of a sudden you're a professional musician. You know, I know with, with me, I, I, it wasn't... I always had a plan, like I say, to, to play the saxophone in as many ways as possible and as well as I could. Other than that, uh, just uh, one, one break after another, one, one incident just led me here, which took me there, and pretty soon I found myself playing with Sonny Stitt, which is like something I, I just you know, couldn't imagine when I was 14. I, was, I, was, I couldn't even, the first time I saw him, I couldn't even talk to him. I was too nervous. The road goes on. It keeps moving. It's about the road. The road doesn't end. There no. is no end to the road. <laughs> the road is about a lot of fun, isn't it? That's a lot of it. That's some of it. It's it's also a lot of work, and it's, it can also be very lonely, as you know. You you you're on the road a lot yourself, and uh, but it's whatever it is, it's it's worthwhile, and it's it's the only thing I know how to do. One of the things that I've been very aware of lately is the passing of great players. You don't have to look far to see it. Mm, um, it's true. 
and you can pick any instrument, and you can pick any era, and they're leaving us very quickly. That's true. I was struck very much when Cannibal Adderley died because I'm old enough to remember Cannibal Adderley coming in. Mm-hmm. I remember the arrival of Cannibal on the scene and what a great thrill it was to hear his sound and right. to know he was with us. A and new this, bird, they said. A new bird just came back, and he, he turned everybody's head around. Yeah. And then he was gone. Mm-hmm. I always loved Cannibal. He's probably one of my favorite alto saxophones because he, he first of all, his sound yeah. so so beautiful and so definable, and and everything about him, the the, the melodies he plays were so so beautiful, so melodic. Uh, when I was with the Buddy Rich band, my girlfriend used to like his uh, version of "Stars Fell in Alabama." Oh, sure. And one time we went to Lenny's on the Turnpike in Boston, and she went up to him, "Oh, Cannibal, we love your song so much," and he played it for us, and. Then we went back and, and hung out with him at his hotel, and, and about a year, a couple of years later, I saw him in Los Angeles. He said, hey, Richie, how you doing? How's the sax coming? How's, how you doing with that saxophone? Yeah, good luck now. Keep on playing. And he, 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 he was always so, so uh, aware of people, and he, he, he treated everyone so well. And I'll never forget how, how, how really nice he was to me and the, the encouragement he gave me. A man who said on one of the introductions on one of his albums, Hipness is not a state of mind, it's a fact of life. <laughs> Cannonball Adderley. And that was Cannonball. And you're mentioning his sound is very much to the point because there are very few saxophone players today who have anything approaching the power of his sound. He doesn't need no microphone, does he? No. And, no. and he's got just a, such, a, such a unique sound and such a pretty sound that uh, you hear a, a, lot of, a lot of saxophone players sounding like several of the guys out there who, you know, several of the sound, the sound categories. Mm-hmm. But uh, <clears throat> you don't hear anyone sounding like Cannonball. How do you develop your own sound? I guess it's, it's, a, it's a process of um, sounding like other people for a while and eventually becoming yourself. Staying on the road long enough. Yeah, that's it, Become, becoming something, uh, something different, something unique. And it's, uh, I don't know, some, some people can, can be playing for years and years and, and still sound like someone else, and some people just develop develop their own thing. Some people come out of, out of nowhere with their own thing. So, uh, you know, I don't know what the answer is. Let's talk about the future of jazz education. I mean, you got most of your real education, I assume, on the road, playing it and learning it and picking up from those who came before you, the oral tradition. Well, I, I also got a lot of good education from my school. I was always in the, the high school band, the marching band, and I went to college and, uh, you know, for a while. And then I w- got... I left school and got into the professional music scene and really learned the truth. But it, to have that background uh-huh. prepared me for the truth. Would that be similar to studying economics or sociology in school and then going out and finding the truth about them out? I mean, you think it's parallel learning music that way? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because uh, it, it, the, the, the main thing is that you learn your instrument. In school. In school. You know, you spend a lot of time to, to, to get, get your instrument. It's like a, a doctor learning how to make his incisions uh-huh. Before he starts actually operating on the brain, you know, a brain mm-hmm. surgeon. So you have to you have to know the background, and and the the history and um, the basics, the basics of what you do. And then after that, you got it. Then you're on your own. I saw a news report of you. I think it was in a small town in Colorado somewhere, leading a group of school children. Right, the children of madness. The children of madness. Right in Denver. What are the children of madness? Um. And that, well, there's several groups of children, man. I, I like working with kids because I really do see the children as the, the future and the hope of what's to, what's to come. Uh, the children in Denver are very small kids, uh, first, second, and third graders. Mm-hmm. That lady named I- Irene Greco has um, a program going there, the, the children of Manus. They, they do all Eddie Jefferson compositions. They sing Eddie Jefferson, all his stuff. And I just did a concert in, in San Francisco. Every year I do a, a Christmas concert. This was my sixth annual Christmas concert at the Great American Music Hall, featuring uh, a little older group of the, the children of Madness, 45 of them, mm-hmm. singing jazz, bebop jazz, uh, Christmas carols, mm-hmm. in harmony, and, and really, a really fine, really f- fine group of kids. Uh, a guy named Dick Whittington is coaching them out there. How would you recommend somebody go about working with children to teach them jazz or to give them a jazz attitude? Well, I would suggest play them the music. Let them hear it. Mm -hmm. How about participating in the music? How can you get a group of 40, 9, and 10-year-olds to participate together without it being a train wreck? Well, in this particular case, uh, uh, Dick Whittington had them rehearsed. 
he had arrangements and they rehearsed and then they came in and performed with my group. But I tell you, it's it's not it's not difficult to get young kids to participate because they're wide open for that. They'd love to do it. Mm -hmm. I see it as a very good beginning and a very good base for uh, the future of music. So that there's there's some fine things coming. That the the state of jazz is in a wonderful condition these days. Absolutely wonderful. The, the, these next uh, from now on, I don't see any any cutoff point, but from now on, jazz is, is going to be more and more popular and more and more accepted by everyone. That's Richie Cole and Ben Sidron speaking some 35 years ago. That little musical interlude of El Dorado Caddy featured the late Tim Hauser of the Manhattan Transfer singing on Richie's Pop Bop album, which was produced by my dad and recorded shortly after the interview was done. I called singer Janice Siegel of the Manhattan Transfer last week to talk about her friendship with Richie. Here, Janice explains how she and the very same Tim Hauser came to meet Richie Cole when he was working with Eddie Jefferson. Hey. When I showed up, I kind of associated Richie and you together with one another. Yes. Why is that? Because we were seeing each other, if you can call it that. In a, in a sort of bohemian jazz musician kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> we were together for a while. And I met him through Tim Hauser because Tim, and we were living here. Tim became aware that Eddie was playing at his church or something in the city, that he had sort of reappeared. And you had this young musical director, this firebrand, who was like our age, basically. And... Um, and was sort of guiding Eddie's musical comeback in a very fiery way. Tim just flipped for both of them, of course. Well, Eddie goes without saying, but he just could not believe uh, Richie Cole. And he told us about it and then introduced us. I don't remember the very, very first time, but we blossomed into a lot of creative projects, both me and Richie and also the transfer of Richie. And uh, we were we, we were planning on doing a lot more stuff with, with both Richie and Eddie. You describe just briefly now, you know, this this young guy, he was like, you're, you know, the same age as everybody in the band. Then he had this energy. And, you know, when you and I spoke the other day, you referred at one point to Richie as being like a diamond. Mm -hmm. Yes. And by that, I mean, he was sharp. I mean, the edges were sharp. Everything was crystal clear. The improvisations were like a fountain of crystalline energy, just flowing and overflowing and falling all over each other. He just couldn't get it out fast enough. Yeah. But the sound, the sound was something. I mean, and every great player has their own sound. I mean, you listen to Bill Evans, Fred Hirsch, you listen to... You know, Ben Webster, you listen to Dizzy Gillespie, they all have their sound that is identifiable. Their, their timbre and the way they approach the music. And Richie had that, I think. Yeah. And yet he was so much out of Bird also, and so much in, in that lineage. Yes. Yeah, well, he was a traditionalist. Yeah. That's where we really connected, you know, as far as the transfer goes, because we were very much historians and building on what came before us and respectful of what came before us. But yeah. we also wanted to bring it into the future. Well, and in both cases also, you had that respect for the tradition and that real ability to execute, but also were not afraid of being entertainers and of putting on not a show. Not at all. And that's another area where we connected yeah. with Richie. Oh, the whole Alto Madness experience. Yes. I mean, I recently came across, um, well, let me preface this by saying before the Manhattan Transfer first went to Japan for the first time, yeah. Tim and I stopped off in Honolulu. Mm -hmm. I had never been to Hawaii. And it seemed like a great idea to spend a few days in, in Hawaii and then head to Japan. Yeah. So Tim and I went, and we knew that Richie was playing there. <laughs> so we were hanging with Richie, and that's where we met the wild man of Mindanao, uh, Bobby Enriquez. Because uh -huh. he was living in Honolulu, and he was Richie's piano player. Right. And they were playing at this very suspicious club called Marrakesh. Uh-huh. 
in Honolulu. Okay. And Tim and I, you know, we would we would hang out at the beach all day, and at night for three sets, we were there at this club called Marrakesh, and I taped the shows. Mm. And can I just read you the set list for one of the sets, please? And the cast of characters, please. Okay, this was the <laughs> set in uh, in Honolulu, Hawaii, featuring Bobby and Rika on piano. Bernie the Bebop Bunny, <laughs> the dynamic Francis King, Sadismo from the Planet of Pain, yes, Big Ed, Swing and Pete, and Poetry in Motion. The set list, though, is Lucy and Desi, the, you know the Lucy theme that he used to do, featuring Sadismo yeah. from the Planet of Pain, Red Top, vocals by Janice and Tim. Yeah. Then I just have here vocal improvisation quotation sick. Yeah. Richie, Janice, and Tim. Then Jazzorama Blues and F. Yes. Featuring the dynamic Francis King on Toyota Trumpet and the Leather Bound Woman. Hmm. And that's what I have on this cassette. I'm glad that you're you're willing to talk about this because both <laughs> the, the image of Sadismo and also the sick vocal improvisation, which I don't know that I was ever allowed to experience in real time. You were I mean too young, I honey. was too young. But it has been sort of imitated for me over the years, and it was a kind of a <laughs> filthy scat singing technique that he developed. Kind of, yeah. It was kind of a filthy scat singing technique. It was so cathartic, too. It was, it was fun. And, you know, I mean, I guess the gist of this whole thing is that yeah. Richie gave us permission to yeah. be totally free. Yeah. And everything was okay. I don't think he took care of himself. Yeah as well as he could have. And uh, this is the thing. I mean, musicians are, especially touring musicians, are athletes, really. Wow. You know, that is a really interesting thing to say. And coming from you, I'm not surprised. You know, you, you and I used to go to the same gym in the West Village, and I would see you there all the time, you know, mm -hmm. exercising ferociously. And you're also, as we know, somebody who, when not in a pandemic, spends a lot of time <laughs> on the road. It's a physical sport. It is a physical, physical sport, especially for singers, I will yeah. say that. Yeah. It's terrifying how those tiny little vocal cords are connected to our self-image and our well-being yeah. and, our, and our livings. You know? Yeah, but you talk about self-image, and I, I get the feeling that when it comes to Richie, he was in some ways living the version of the jazz life that he envisioned for himself. I agree with that. Oh, he was so into that. Yeah. It was the jazz. It was the jazz life, totally. And I wanted to join him in that yeah. for a while. You know, live in the van mm. and travel around and be free and just play music all the time and. You know, let everybody sit in, mm -hmm. and <laughs> you know, <laughs> even Sadismo from the Planet of oh, Pain. Oh yes, I have a picture of Sadismo, which uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't only want to focus on the ridiculousness, but there is yeah. a, an anecdote, and I don't know if you are willing to tell it. And I believe it involves you and Tim Hauser and Richie Cole on the Gong Show. Oh yeah, I'll tell it. Oh absolutely, it wasn't. It was everybody. It was Alan and Cheryl too. It was the whole band. Okay, we decided to. This is this is really just about when we're we're really meeting Richie and getting you know getting into uh, his his aesthetic. Right. We all dressed up. We all put masks on. Yeah. I mean, Cheryl was wearing. I remember distinctly a gorilla mask uh -huh. and a forties like beautiful forties cocktail dress, and I had on a white afro wig and yeah we all had wigs on or paper bags over our head or something and we went on with richie and G, this guy jeep duquesne and we played uh beat me daddy a to the bar and we sang it in four-part harmony and we sang into rubber chickens and then we beat each other up with the rubber chickens yeah. and did unspeakable things with those yeah. chickens and the horrifying thing about this story is that we didn't we didn't pass the audition yeah yeah <laughs> But it was it was a bonding exercise. Yes, I, I look I look at it now as as that. Well, it's this kind of energy and it's this kind of mentality that you know. This is why I kind of wanted to call you to talk about Richie because these are the kinds of stories that I think do kind of want to be told about him. We would be remiss not to talk about the kind of hijinks that he brought with him. Yes, I agree. I mean, 
okay, he w- he was a serious and brilliant alto player. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Is it? There's a thousand recordings to testify to that, and and a thousand more live performances. But yeah, it was really his whole worldview. I yeah. think, yeah. and and that the Gong Show is just one example of many many hijinks we got into with him. And how do you hope that the story is told about him when it gets inscribed in the book? You know, what do you hope people remember about him? I hope they remember his playing. Yeah. That's what I hope. Because he was a direct link from Charlie Parker to Phil Woods to Richie Cole. Mm -hmm. He was committed to the bebop lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he did... He ascribed to that old adage from Charlie Parker, if you don't live it, it won't come out of your horn. And he believed that a thousand percent. So that's why he didn't want anything to tie him down. And when I met him, anyway, uh-huh. he wanted to be f- traveling around in the big blue van and just stopping wherever he felt like it to play music and with whomever he wanted to mm-hmm. play with. Mm-hmm. He was about the music. That's what I want people to remember. Yeah. And he loved to play gigs. He loved playing. He loved to play. Yeah. That's what he loved to do, besides eating at the spaghetti factory. That was his idea of a romantic evening out. But it sounds like you were very taken with him for a, for a time, that there was something was very, very seductive about it. Totally seductive. Yeah, very seductive. As I say, we were both uh, traditionalists in a way, yeah. Yeah. you know, <laughs> but uh, actually even more than the spaghetti factory. I remember evenings with him. Yeah. At Puglia's in Little Italy here in New York. Yep. It was this place that made their own wine in the back. <laughs> and we would drink gallons of this shit yeah. and eat the over eat the pasta. Yeah. And there would be someone sitting in there would be an organ player there yeah. that would be playing music and yep. we would sit in and just have an amazing time, like for hours and hours with this. That was another thing that Richie and I shared. We loved, shall I call it bad music? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I collect it myself. I mean, just, and there's two categories. One is intentional. Mm -hmm. And then there's the unintentional. Yeah. Which is maybe even better. Maybe even better. So we, we definitely shared that love. We would listen to music, but really, I would just, he would love to play and I would, he would push me. Mm. Again, and really, it was fantastic for me to be liberated in that way. Yeah. Really important lessons there for me. Do you yeah. think, for better or for worse, that the jazz life as he lived it or tried to live it, is that even a thing that exists in the 21st century? Is that a thing that a young, hot diamond of an alto player getting into it today could even attempt to live in the way that Richie lived it? I'm not sure that that is, that is something to be stri- striven for this, yeah. these days, honestly. I mean, first of all, young people know too much yeah. these days. <laughs> they know where that leads. Yeah, History has shown us that 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 it's uh, you can burn out if unless you want to burn out as a as a short intense flame yeah you know which uh, you can make that choice certainly you know what maybe we're so far removed from bird at this point from charlie parker that the romanticism of living like that yes i think it's worn off a little bit and th- and there was a lot of pain associated with that lifestyle as well janice before we hang up is there anything else that you want to say about richie or about how you're feeling right now in general Oh, well, I was I was heartbroken when I heard the news, but and really kind of happy that it happened. I mean, for all reports that I've gotten, yes, he just died in his sleep. I know it. So he stopped breathing. That's it. That's pretty good. The cat hung f- by a thread for so much of his life, and he actually <laughs> got out. You know, he got out. Yeah, he cool. got out without too much pain. Yeah. All right. Later. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. To close today, I called my dad to talk about Richie and to try to put a little context into the conversation. Hey. Did you hear the interview that I sent you? I did. You interviewed Richie. What, when, what year do you think that was that you were talking to Richie Cole? 85, maybe. 1985. Because the record he was talking about was the record we made in 86 called Pop Bop 
where he said it was going to be the the new combination of the commercial and the uh, bebop. He says he's 37 years old in that conversation. Okay. He died this year at 72, so he was four years younger than you. So you're 41 years old in that conversation. You are two years younger than I am right now talking to you. (laughs) Okay. Yes. (laughs) The reason I really liked hearing the conversation was because there's always this kind of part of the story about what a fireball he was, how much energy he had, and how much humor and life he was full of. And I suppose that I caught some of that, but even by the time I came to really know him as a young adult, he seemed older than that. He had already kind of started to become a little down and out. I mean, here in this conversation he's talking about well, he's obviously working a lot, and he's he's traveling a lot. Richie Cole, for a minute, was on all the downbeat choice, critics' choice, or popular choice polls. He had a moment where he did really well, and he showed up, and everybody loved his tone, and he was recording with all the cats. And he was, uh, before there were young lions, he was, was something like that. He was being celebrated. And, and well, as he says... Uh, in that conversation, you know, he was torn by the two poles of of show business and bebop. And he was, you know, Richie was open to everything that needed to be done once. And so it took a, a, a toll on him It took a heavy toll on him. He was physically older in the 90s. Uh, but of course, you met him in the 80s when he sent you on stage with a clarinet. And just think to yourself, What went into that event? I mean, we were at the house. He somehow spirited a clarinet into your possession, showed you how to blow through it or something, plotted with you. As a very young boy. I mean, I'm four or something, five. You're four years old. Plotted with you to walk out on stage in the middle of a concert. I mean, it was the first thing that happened. And uh, so, you know, he would follow an idea through all the way. He was committed to the moment. He he loved coming up with things, and hanging out with him was what was a series of events that, by and large, uh, never came to fruition. But at the moment, everybody in the van or the room was committed. Well, I appreciated that he said in the interview that he he was pulled between these two impulses. One was the serious one and one was the entertainment one. And and you alluded even then to the idea that he was criticized for it, that he couldn't get taken seriously by some of the jazz press because they saw him as too uh, showbiz. Absolutely. As the same criticism uh, was leveled at uh, Dizzy in the 40s. I mean, that's what they said. Richie made it a point to uh, walk in the door with some kind of a scheme, any door he walked into. Absolutely. He had a scheme that, that was part of his M.O. I always have to tell you my favorite Richie Cole story, which you know very well, which is we're backstage at Carnegie Hall. We're doing a tribute to Eddie Jefferson. Everybody's on the bill. Dizzy's on the bill. Moody, the Manhattan Transfer, John Hendricks, Bobby McFerrin. Everybody's on the bill. And me and Richie are in, in backstage and we're getting ready to go on, you know, and suddenly in the door walks Professor Irwin Corey. And if you don't know who he was, he was on like the Sid Caesar show or Ed Sullivan or whatever. And he played this crazed, befuddled professor. And in fact, he was pretty crazed, not befuddled. Richie was a pal of his. And they were somehow discussing the fact that it would be a great idea for Professor Irwin Corey to walk out on stage at Carnegie Hall and introduce us with his shtick. And we all got caught up in the moment and we all said, yeah, this is a great at me too. Oh, this is a genius idea, of course. And, and then uh, somehow, I don't know if Richie was behind it, when the promoter came in and, and we told the promoter, yeah, and Professor Erwin Corey is going to introduce us. The promoter said, absolutely not. There's no way I'm going to allow that to happen. He's uncontrollable. Somehow we said, well, then we're not going on. Huh. Well, it's insane. You know, we, we drew a line in the sand. The professor now, you had to, you had flown from Madison, Wisconsin to New York. You bought some new shoes for the event. You're backstage. You're playing with all the, the top jazz singers. You're being taken seriously as one of them. And you somehow are roped in through the Michigas of 
Richie Cole to demand that Irwin Corey bring you out or you're not going to go on stage? For a moment, it came to that. Uh, in any case, the promoter ultimately let Irwin Corey go on and introduce us with the caveat that uh, he would give him exactly two minutes or three minutes. And if he wasn't off stage by then, he would be escorted off stage. And this it came to pass that he started talking and he started uh, dissembling and going off on this tirade. And uh, two minutes into it, these two big guys walked out on the stage, one each got him under one arm and dragged him off. And as he was going off, he said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Richie Cole, Ben Zidrin. It was genius. It was it was just great. So that, in a way, helps me pivot to the other thing that I want to talk about, because I think he represents a few things also, you know, and I think he represents the road, living a life on the road. I think he represents something that he really devoted his life to, which is the quote unquote jazz life, whatever that means. And his loss is coming at an interesting time because so much is being made right now of the loss in the jazz community because of coronavirus. And so many older black jazz musicians in particular are are succumbing to this thing. Now, Richie did not die of coronavirus. And so it's an interesting time to be looking at what it means to live a jazz life and die a jazz death in some ways in the, the context of today's world. In your conversation with him that takes place in 1985, you say to him, we're losing the generation of musicians, many of whom you were old enough to see when they came on the scene like Cannonball. And this is a conversation that you had 35 years, 35 years ago. Yeah. And what we didn't say or even think back then is that he and I were kind of one foot in the past and one foot in the future. Uh, He more than I, having been on the road with Lionel Hampton, you know, Lionel Hampton used to, it's a famous story. We played at Birdland and in the middle of a tune, he led the band out onto the street, still playing, flying home or whatever it was, took the audience with him, had a bus pull up, put everybody in the bus, drove around, came back to Birdland and went back up on the stage. I mean, that's a reportedly true story about Lionel Hampton. So Richie, he was a jazz dog. He, he, I don't think there's too much in the jazz world that he didn't know or participate in. So, yeah, he was going to die a jazz death, whatever that meant. When we were talking about it, I think you could hear in the way how reverently he was talking about Sonny Stitt. He he didn't feel equal to his elders. I don't think any of us did. I mean, uh, I certainly didn't. Hmm. And Richie was up there performing with Duke Jordan and Cats. You know, I mean, that life doesn't exist anymore. Not only could you not live like Richie Cole anymore, you couldn't die like Richie Cole anymore. Well, I guess that's kind of what I'm thinking about. It's like he died young. You know, I mean, he died relatively young, 72 years old. For anybody who saw him in the last handful of years, he didn't look good. He looked like he was 92. He looked very old and he needed help getting around. And, you know, so it was very clear. And he was quite optimistic until the up until the end, I think. But when you hear what he was into at 37 years old, I mean, it was a life. Obviously, it's 35 years ago, but it was a life. At that pivotal moment, you're asking him about education, the the way education interacts with the traditional way people would get their experience, which was on the road or by watching other people. And he and he at the moment, at that very moment, he said, no, it's both. It's both. You have to learn how to play your instrument. That's what I mean by he had a foot in each world. Yeah. Uh, I recently saw uh, an interview with Lou Donaldson. Yeah. And who's, you know, maybe 10 years older than Richie. And Lou Donaldson said... Man, I taught myself how to play, and everybody I knew taught themselves how to play. That's how you learn. So in the interim, 10 years somewhere, jazz education had started. Or, or, or at least band education. You know, like for years, uh, DeSable High School in Chicago had this uh, teacher, Captain Walter Diet, who taught all these great jazz musicians, but not from the point of view of jazz, but from the point of view of their instruments. So, you know, there was always that. But when it came to learning to play jazz, well, as Richie says, you know, he he learned that. What did he call it? <laughs> I found out the truth, he said. Yeah. <laughs> After school, I went and I found out the truth. Yeah, I mean. I think you got him. I think you, you, you got a good beat on him. I mean, 
he was a one-off. He was controversial from all points of view, whether you were jazz police or, but, but he had fans who absolutely adored him and adored everything he did. And lo- he turned a lot of people on. He had hundreds, he says thousands of orchestrations that he did that he would take around and play with high school students and play with young kids. And I mean, I guess you'd have to say if there's such a thing as jazz advocacy, he lived that. And that's what Alto Madness could also be interpreted as, not just crazed, insane (laughs) jazz flights of fantasy, but, you know, humanizing it, making it fun. Man, you know, the other thing is I am really touched by having discovered that conversation with you and Richie today and hearing the two of you and your friendship and your complicit uh, energy. (laughs) What did it feel like for you to hear that? I mean, I know over the years you've gone back and you've heard your interviews and, and I can only imagine that it's almost like listening to a person that is both you and is not you. Exactly. Well, the first thing that I heard was that how he and I, we were like Geats Romo, you know? It was like a Del Close routine. It was like a Del Close routine. We were so modest, you know, and so uh, calm about this, the way we talked about it. We were so, on the surface. No, but that's why it was so delinquent, man. I mean, there was something in the sound of your voice that was just so, every every question was a setup. It wasn't, you know, and that's how Totally. I think it's hard to interview people. And that's why I appreciate that you and I have been able to have these conversations over the years on, on, on the record, because it's actually very difficult to have a proper interview with somebody that you know that that well. Well, we were totally co-conspirators. And so uh, we just maintained the conspiracy. You know, we maintained this very sober front when we're talking about this. That's what I loved about it. What I what I got from that conversation is how deep we were into it. The only way you could really do that is practice. I mean, you that just shows that you have to go through, you know, as out as he was when he checked into a hotel or got on an airplane or get a bank loan, he had to learn how to, you know, put on a front. And you two both just snapped into your uh, this is us being serious people now fronts that was that was our interpretation of it yes Yes. (laughs) oh man i mean i traveled with him in his van a little bit and it 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 was always an adventure i mean just being on the road with him driving the van and the detours and the conversations and waking up and trying to make it to the gig you know and we were late at some gigs man we didn't know how long it was going to take and we drove and we pulled up and the room was full of people waiting for us and he starts into his song and dance routine entertaining the people and we're setting up a, i mean it, 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 that yeah, it was a role with richie it, it really was old school anybody who spent time with richie fell into one or another of his parallel universes and became either co-conspirators fans or just outraged, I mean, by how far he would take it. But he could play. See, that was the whole thing. You can do that if you can play. He didn't focus on the playing, and it made his godfather, Phil Woods, angry at him because Phil saw that he had more potential than he developed, perhaps. But he could play. I can't conceive of physically what the last 10 years of his life must have been like. He was in constant pain and a broken leg and bad circulation and one thing after another. But he never let on that it was a problem. I mean, he would tell you what it was going on and then he'd laugh at it. Well, onward. Yeah, it's great that he went in his sleep, huh? The only better way is to finish playing your favorite ballad and stand up. And as you take a bow, you just keep going down. (laughs) That would be the first best way. (laughs) Yeah. I think Richie, you know, would have been happy if he knew how he went out. (laughs) I think that would have been fine with him. You would think it would make me feel old to have my pal Richie pass like that and, and be so old. But I just remember him as young. I still do. I, re- I remember that Richie Cole. There it was. There it went. Richie Cole. I'll be back again soon with another deep dive. Until then, I'll talk to you soon. There's Richie Cole. He's trying to hide, but he got me through some rough times. Richie, thank you. 
Celebrate life. Yeah. God bless the child who has got their own. Oh, look at this now. Look at this. They're coming around with bow ties, handing out fine champagne. I think life is all right. We've got 50 seconds to 1988. Anybody else got one last, one last word for 87? Let the good times roll. Let them roll, let them roll. Let the good times roll. Let them roll all night long. Nine. Eight, seven, six, five, four.